Welcome to the High Tech Freedom Podcast. This is a podcast where we bring successful tech sales professionals, thought leaders, and entrepreneurs to share best practices, insights, and lessons learned with other tech sales professionals. As a sales professional, the more we learn, the more we earn. Once we earn it, how can we put those hard earned commission dollars back to work to build additional income streams that will create the freedom we are all working to achieve? I'm your host, Chris Freeman. I'm a high-tech sales leader, real estate investor, and lifetime learner. All right. Well, welcome to the High Tech Freedom Podcast. This is episode number 50. And I have to say, I am so excited to hit the 50 episode mark. And if you've listened to any of my earlier episodes on goals, I make a lot of them. And this was one of them. I wanted to do 50 podcast episodes for the year. And here we are at August and we've hit it. So I'm definitely going to have to go uh, redo those goals. But more importantly, I am so humbled by all the great guests that have generously taken time out of their schedule to share insights with my audience. And selfishly, I've picked up so many great ideas and even reminders of things I, I just know I need to do more of and best practices. And What's been really fun about the whole process is I often just take some of these great lessons learned and I take them right back into my business. So thank you for that. So again, thank you to all all the listeners. Thank you to the past guests. I really appreciate it. So on to today for our next guest, I am thrilled to have JP Arley join us. While many of the guests that I do bring on come from the high tech space, I do like to bring in some sales professionals and entrepreneurs that, that come from other industries and you know provide some diversity and perspective on selling that's different than you know the people that are in the high tech space. So JP brings that. He spent 20 years in the Cutco world as a sales leader teaching and helping people grow and develop as sales rep. He also spent after that he spent about 7 years at a company called Vivint Smart Home where he had a number of sales leadership positions and Uh, What's interesting about JP, which is really why I wanted to bring him on, is his entire sales career has been centered around the direct selling model. And I'll have him touch a little bit more on that when we dig into it. Uh, JP's also, he's been a Harvard Business School certified executive coach for years. And he's currently the president at a company called Motion Solar Group. And they're a full service solar sales agency representing a number of leading solar manufacturers and installers and companies and really just building that right solution for each customer to help really drive that dream of getting more clean energy into the consumer's hands all around the country. So with that said, JP, welcome to the High Tech Freedom Podcast. Dude, it's been too long. Thanks for having me. Pleasure is all mine. And JP and I, we first met actually at Cutco. I was running a branch office and you were... So we probably met, I'm going to guess and say... June 15th, 1992. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, a long time ago. Do the math. That gives you an idea how long we've been working, right? Yeah, it's all right, though. Uh, I'm the older I get, the better I was. So we're good. That's right. Well, hey, well, let's jump into it. So, JP, I mean, you've had a really interesting uh, sales career and sales progression. And I know you and I kind of know the Cutco world. But you know, how does somebody make a sales career of 20 years selling knives and leading a team of knife sellers? Pure luck. When I look back about, on it, it was, you know, I was so naive coming out of college. I had blinders on. I thought I wanted to, you know, work in Market Street in San Francisco. I was interning for Merrill Lynch when I met you and I had this path. And being at the time a college athlete, being highly competitive, I needed to just take that one additional quarter of school, which bought me the time to take that summer job with you. and. It was just luck. At the time, Cutco was coming into their own. Uh, I think there wasn't very many you know, college graduates at the time that were management there. And so they were hyper aggressive in recruiting me post, post-graduation. And then when you really look at the model, it's kind of the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours. You just do the same thing every week. You recruit, you train, you retain, you develop, and you repeat that cycle. And if you do that long enough, then the success piles up. And when success piled up, then you start making the money where you start not looking for other things to do. And then, of course, you know, the success comes with a little bit of umbrella, kind of hidden rock star status. And so you're getting recognition from peers and, you know, at 23, 24, having several hundred people work underneath you. And, you know, it just 
pure luck, right? Mm-hmm. And and I'm very blessed and to see the things that that company has done over the last 30 years since I first touched it has been amazing, but truly is, you know, attracting young talent, developing them, retaining them and being a son of two teachers. It was just the kind of the right fit for me. So I just say it was lucky that I yeah. got blessed with that opportunity. Well, I, you know, I know you say it's luck, but we didn't talk about this in advance, but I remember when I interviewed you, when you started, we were out there in, I don't know, Citrus Heights, California, and you were taking a class where the textbook was Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I can't believe you remember that. I yeah, well, that. it introduced me to the book. And so the fact that you were learning that in college, well, I mean, what an incredible foundation that I think that helps propel you to go do what you did. Yeah, the cool thing about Dr. Lawrence Shepard um, is we had a question about the book and he pulled out this briefcase and pulled out one of those old brick cell phones and called Stephen Covey. <laughs> I was like, did he just call the author? Right. And, you know, and we called the author. So yeah, it was long. Line. And now I happen to live in an estate where the Covey family's name is all over the place. And so, um, but yeah, that was, um, again, that was also luck. There was a teacher who was beyond his time. He was buying half a Davis at the time and I didn't know it. And he was just an entrepreneur who was a professor that wanted to have an influence on students. And he was using the academic world to do that. He didn't need to work. He, I mean, like I said, he was buying half the town. And so, yeah, just luck again. I mean, everything I think is, is luck and how you choose to look at it. Yeah. And then I think, and also then what do you do when that luck lands in front of you? You know, do you grab onto it and run with it? Or you know, I think there's a big part of that good decision-making. You know, Cause I feel very fortunate in my career and I've had the opportunity to I took the right job out of college and I felt like it was a little bit of luck, but I had, I could have gone two directions. Right. And it's a matter of making that right decision when that luck is presented in front of you. So, well, so I'm curious, JP, so a little over 20 years doing the Cutco thing, a lot of success, and then you leave and you go to Vivint Home Solutions. That must've been a tough transition after doing one thing for so long. Yeah. You know, it's being in that independent contractor business owner world, you're a little bit stay naive to things like cost of living index. And and we were just absolutely dominating, dominating the rest of the country. And it seems like we were making less money and margins were getting smaller, costs were increasing. And so you start to go, huh, I was in California and where entrepreneurial opportunities aren't just sitting there, right? You come to Utah and you're like, oh, plot of land, buy it, right? Like those things didn't exist in California. So you're a little bit sheltered on what other entrepreneurial activities there were to kind of multi-stream because uh, you couldn't really buy real estate that was cash flowing. And kind of like, so I was a little bit limited and I was frustrated. And so I started looking for different things to do. And I was really super concerned about how my really simple skill set would translate in the corporate world. Mm-hmm. Um, by pure luck, I get a phone call on my birthday uh, or a text on my birthday of somebody who was working at an event. We start sh- shooting the shit. And I call him and I say, can I ask you you know, 20 questions about the model? I think there might be something I could steal and make my business better. That all turned into the recruiting process at Vivid. But I realized that you know, I probably should have left a few years earlier. I probably should have given people behind me the opportunity to step up. If I wasn't really motivated, saw that things weren't the way I wanted. But what I found was those four skill sets of recruiting, training, retaining, and developing, that 10,000 hours apply to all of those, Mm -hmm. are the most coveted skill sets outside of that world. And so I really kind of hit Vivid in my stride and had, as you saw, as you said, many different opportunities in those seven years because of those different skill sets. Yeah. So, you know, I'm curious... uh... You said something that kind of reminded me a little bit about, you know, your Cutco model and probably very similar to what you were doing at Vivint, which is a lot of training. And how important or kind of what is your thought around that reinvestment of knowledge and and kind of constantly improving your skill set to really raise your game, you know, in the sales world? For the individuals, I think it's if you're not investing in yourself, then you're you're getting passed, right? And so there's somebody. A lot of times, salespeople get stuck where they're not making enough, or they don't like their boss, or they start creating circumstances that are holding them back. But the reality is, there is somebody that would kill, literally walk through a wall for the opportunity that you have, and you you tend to see the challenges when they when they're like wait. I can make 150 grand and have that job. I would do anything. Yet the guy that or gal that has that job is like, I got 150, but my friends down the street make you know 200 somewhere else. And you know you don't. The grass is never greener, right? Yeah. Never. It tastes the same. It tastes like manure, right? Like <laughs> like you have to go and grind for it. So if I'm in sales and I'm not happy, the world. I mean, you and I had cassette tapes and CDs in our car. YouTube has saved me, I don't know, five to $10,000 in fixing stuff in my house. Imagine if I was young, how much it would make me 
just watching videos on how to do the job I need to do. And so if I'm in sales, I'm constantly investing. And that's kind of where the Harvard piece came from. You know, I was sitting on the couch one day and I was watching our CEO speak at one of their events. And I was thinking, huh, what does my post direct sale resume look like? Not as good as I want. So I ponied up to 55 grand and I went out mm-hmm. to Harvard Business School and went through their executive leadership. Uh, it's called professional leadership development. By chance, the person who was my executive coach worked at the coaching school I'd went to years before. And that's how I ended up working there. But it was a $55,000 investment that has made me, I don't know, 10 or 20x that. And that was only maybe three or four years ago. And so if you're not investing in yourself, you're not rethinking the way you should do things, then you're going to get passed by those who are killing for what you want or what you have. Yeah, it's, um, you know, nowadays you can go do it for free. You could spend as little as you want, as much as you want. The amount of information that's out there is just, you know, as everybody knows, it's unlimited. But there is some are higher level quality than others. I'm curious, you know, if you were kind of a mid-career sales rep right now, is there a certain area within your knowledge base that you might go work on, you know, when it comes to selling? Is there any... Self, Yeah. right? Work on yourself. Like Like mindset or what do you mean by that? Yeah. So, you know, what's the catchphrase nowadays? Um, Mindfulness, right? You know, whether it's yoga or breathing or exercising or sitting on top of the mountain or going hiking, which is kind of where I am right now in my career is, you know, I don't want to get too much into some of these details, but the working on your inner self, being happy with who you are, not looking at your past and looking at maybe all the mistakes that you made, but looking at the future and seeing all the opportunity in front of you. But if I'm mid-career, there's a saying that, well, I think hurting people also hurt their careers. So if they're unhappy with who they are for whatever reason, when somebody, you know, cursed them up the street, they got dumped, they're overweight, or, you know, they got demoted or they got passed over, then they're going to start hurting themselves and their opportunities. So getting right with who you are and what you stand for, mm-hmm. you know, my personal vision statements on the wall behind me and having these like these lighthouses to make sure that you know where you're going and why you're going there and nothing else matters. Somebody flips you off in the street corner, doesn't affect me. Right. Somebody has a bad opinion about me because I'm direct. I can't change their opinion about me. It's not who I am as a person. They just haven't taken the time to get to know me. So if I'm in sales and I'm mid-career, you already know how to sell. It's how you got the job. It's how you've got to mid-career. And so what do you miss out on? You, you're probably missing out on the human connection. So you're selling less. Mm-hmm. And the reason you're missing out on the human connection is because you're not connected with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And just so your statement says, I want to positively impact the lives of others and change the course of history. Yeah. The big statement. That's that's right. Yeah. I'm just curious, how is that translated into some of the things you've done or you're trying to do? So this is not, you know, you're not going to see me out running a 5,000 person, go build houses in, in Peru or, you know, that's not my, my, my change to how I want to change history. It's kind of like how you changed my life. It was a random job for you, right? And you introduced me to, to sales and that was a ripple in my life. And so a lot of it comes from how I want to be as a father. What kind of, you know, I took my 11 year old to lunch today or to breakfast today at 6.30 before school. And weirdly enough, we talked about 1031 exchanges, right? Like, <laughs> right? And, when the, and the value of that and the step up and, and the inheritance and the trusts and all that, and whether he got it all or not, he asked. So I told him, but when I left Vivid, I you know, I had all these choices. Did I want to go into consulting? Did I want to just work with a small group? Did I want to go work for a company? I want to start my own. And I had to get right about what I really wanted to do. And everything I touch now, everything I do now, if it doesn't allow me to have influence and have a positive effect on people that will change the course of their life, mm-hmm. then I won't do it. I had a lunch meeting today with a gentleman that I'm probably going to partner in a franchise with. He has, he has the work ethic and the drive, have the experience and the means. And he asked me, why me? Right. Basically, it was a conversation I over and I just said, why you is because part of the reason I'd want to do this is it would completely, completely change your life when we're successful. Right. And then maybe what he does is that he has a better life for his family and that changes his son's life. And then his son, you know, influences his children differently. So my influence is like, what's the one thing I can do one person at a time that will echo in eternity? Right. Mm -hmm. And so they'll say, you know, back in 2022, I listened to this podcast called High Tech Freedom with this guy named JP. And he said this thing that I've thought about every day since. Great. If I can have that impact on somebody, then then I'm living my vision. And again, how we're deciding to this 1031 exchange, we're going to talk about it later, but I'm putting this to the test. What kind of family memories am I going to create? How many lives can I influence? Does it meet all the criteria? When I chose to work with the company I'm working for, I had five different offers. And I'm like, which one's going to allow me to have the largest impact 
to create the most change in history. And so it's something we did through the HBS programs to come up with a personal vision statement. And it took me, I don't know, six months to come down with something that I can scream passionately about from a soapbox. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And, you know, you talked about you know, being in a role and getting yourself right. And for those listeners that are in a, working for a high tech company today, you've all seen this where there's somebody in a territory and they're not doing well. You know, they, there's no business there. They're not, you know, it's too much competition, whatever the reason is that they're saying, you know, it's impacting their business. And then they leave and then somebody else jumps in the territory and they absolutely crush it. And kind of in line with what you're saying, it's about perspective. It's about how they view things, how they view themselves and how they, you know, they don't think about the things that could go wrong. They think about the things that they want to go do, where they're going. And so much of that is it comes down to perspective and, you know, how so you want to be viewed. There's somebody I could introduce you to. Uh, he's in high tech. His name is Nate, Nate Randall. He's the CEO of Gab Wireless, which is cell phones and watches for kids. We spent some time together. He said something. He was telling me about he used to sell copiers and he's lived in golf and he used to sell copiers and really didn't like selling copiers. Just, so what he did is he just played golf with all the people he needed to sell copiers to. And, and sure enough, he played golf. His sales go up and, and he'll tell the story much better. And he's starting to succeed. And, and he sits down with his boss and his boss is like, you're doing great. He's like, I got to tell you, all I really do is just take these guys out and play golf. And he's like, Nate, I'm really happy you told me that. I wish you had told me sooner so I could have paid for the golf, right? Like <laughs> Nate took a job that maybe he didn't really wasn't enjoying and made it enjoyable and had success. And so, you know, you just de described territory sales is that my territory sucks. No, mm -hmm. no, my boss sucks. No, nope. right. You suck. Right. Yeah. And if you can't look yourself in the mirror and maybe that's not the job for you, maybe you're not made out for high tech sales. But, you know, there's a, a Jocko Wilnick wrote the book called um, Extreme Ownership. Right. right? Talks right. about there is no. There, right. And are you the sharp stick of truth to yourself? And the other thing, when you were talking, I was thinking of a friend of ours, Mark Lovis, who told me once, I don't know if he stole it from somebody is like, I look for circumstances Right. And if I don't see what I want, I go create my own circumstances for success. And so if you're looking at your situation and you don't like it, be Nate Randall, play golf with your clients, change the way the game is played. So at least you can enjoy your job instead of being miserable at your job, uh, miserable while doing your job. It's the same job. Yeah. Change the way the game is played. I like it. Well, um, JP, for the uh, sake of the listeners, can you just take a moment? So when I talked about direct selling, can you explain how a lot of what you've done over the years is different than what? Um, you know, maybe my audience does. Sure. Um, I, and I'm going to assume tech sales, you have a territory, you have a certain yeah, client base in your base case, your commission. Yeah. Yep. But you're, you have, you got to get past the gatekeepers. It's kind of like pharmaceuticals, but on the tech side. Yep. Direct sales is obviously instead of B2B, it's B2C, right? Straight to the consumer. And our customers have traditionally been in their homes. And so whether the Cutco model where it's like, hey, Chris, this is JP. I don't think you know me. I was over visiting your friend Nancy the other day. Did she tell you? I was like, and you schedule the appointment, right? And you present the product and you, you make a sale. And, and then when we got to Vivint, direct sales there is same thing. But we used canvassing teams where we did old school. We stuck them in. We had a big draft like NF, like, like fantasy football. And they got to draft their markets. I got Tampa. I got Coca-Cola, <laughs> right? And had these huge draft parties. And then they would recruit a bunch of salespeople to go to those markets. We put them in corporate housing and they would get up and they would work six days a week and they would knock doors from two to dark 30. And they would repeat that for 20 weeks of the summer. And all you're doing is taking your exact same product. In this particular case, it was home security and take it to the streets. Now, as perspective, I, I ran the, you know, I launched the retail program with Best Buy at Vivint, which was the same smart home product in 450 Best Buy stores. Well, our direct home people hated it. Right. Because they get like it's retail, like right. you got one good look or two good looks a day. You're stoked. And then they have to decide, oh, I get it. And then the install happens three days later where we would sell the tech would show up before we leave the house. Right. And install the camera and everything done. And then by the whole process from start to finish could be like two hours. Hmm. And so the only difference is, is how you're greeting your customer. You still have to break preoccupation. You still have to get past the gatekeeper. The only difference, I mean, imagine if you're going after a new client in tech. That person doesn't know you. So you have to break that preoccupation of why they should talk to you. Yep. What's in it for them? What's in it for you? Right. And then once you get past that, you go through your sales process. Direct sales is just straight to the consumer. We simply either penetrate their home right now in solar by digital advertising, where somebody would then respond to the digital times of the phone calls, schedule an appointment, and how salesperson would go and close it. Or we have canvassing teams that go out and same thing, 
explain explain net metering, explain solar, set the appointment, and our salespeople go in. So to compare the two, in your, your world, you're just doing it in a suit and an office and trying to catch people at work, where we're doing it in shorts and a flat bill, trying to catch them at home. Yeah. Is it uh, 100% commission or do they also have a base? Well, it's all commission. I mean, yeah. and when you're good at the job, you really never hurt for money. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the commissions are, are high. Right. And so, yeah. I mean, there. next time you see somebody out there sweating with, you know, with a vivid smart home hat and shirt and great people, group guys there, that guy's probably making 600 grand a year knocking doors. Right. Yeah. Like, like you see three or four people listening to him, you can guarantee he's making, making that money and don't feel bad for him when he drives up in his Lamborghini and, you know, or his, or his Audi A8 or whatever. Like yeah. those, he, those guys do well. And he earned it. Right. I mean, he put in the effort and he gets 100% of the results. I hope you are enjoying this episode. I wanted to break in with a quick commercial. During the podcast, we sometimes talk about how to invest those hard-earned commission dollars so that you can build that freedom we are all working towards achieving. Now, I built that through 20 years of real estate investing. Now, recently, my team helped me put together a webinar on how top sales pros can create passive income and achieve financial freedom with hands-off real estate investing. Now, I'm still doing this. And as I continue to invest, I'm giving opportunity for others to learn and invest alongside of me. So if you want to learn more, go check out our webinar at hightechfreedom.com forward slash webinar. That is hightechfreedom.com forward slash webinar. We will also put the link in the show notes. Now back to the show. So JP, you've seen a lot of sales reps over the years, especially in some of these models where you're bringing them in for the summer, training them, and then you know doing it again maybe the next summer. Over the hundreds of reps that you've managed, coached, trained, are there some... You talked about one of them, right? Getting right with yourself. But are there some additional traits that you see that kind of elevate really the top performers from the rest of the pack? So you have traits that you're just born with, right? And then traits you can develop. And so traits you're born with is kind of the questions you ask in the interview process and the fixation, right? Like, what have you been fixated on in your life? Like, you know, um, you think about, were you the best skateboarder on the block? Right? Were you the best video game player? Have you won your fantasy football league? The you know I held the Pac Man record in my hometown for a while in that video game. I was fixated on getting that record. Right? What is something you've done in your past that you've just got so focused on it that all you did is eat, sleep, and breathe that skill set? And it could be concert pianist. It could be you know a debate. It could be whatever. But have you found the ability to fixate on something? And if you have, then if this job is exciting to you. You already know how to fixate. So you can go ahead and focus on that. And that's why you see people in sales who have done, I mean, I don't know what the trend is in high tech, but I can tell you in solar and alarm sales, my number one sales rep played four years middle linebacker, right? Like they knows how to work out, knows how to work hard, knows how to grind and drive. Well, great. Well, the same person could be, you know, they used to play concert piano at a high level. Well, mm-hmm. they know how to prepare a practice. I had a sales rep once at Cutco that she was just phenomenal fixated like you know text her at like 11 30 at night with my wife she's like are you texting them because i know she was up i know she was working how she was thinking well she crushed it right and then randomly at 32 years old she makes the olympic bobsled team and wins a silver medal like this personality hi lauren gibbs right like this personality that just fixates and if you have that in you and it could be just like binge watching tv you have the ability to just focus that's the thing Right. And if there was a second thing, I'd want to know what kind of challenges you dealt with in your life. Mm -hmm. Right. How, what have you overcome? Right. Would you know what true loss is? And if you know what true loss is now, there are people who are highly successful that have never had true loss, but I've been successful, but I sometimes like, man, I wish my life was a little bit harder. I wish a little bit more like, you know, I don't want to be, I never want to be homeless. Don't want people homeless, but man, some of those people just outwork me because they, my drive is high, but their drive is higher. Right. Because they know what they could lose. So you know, I always ask, like, what's the hardest thing you've ever done? Why was it hard? How did you make you feel? How did you feel when you overcame it? Right. And are you able to tap those emotions? Because I think knocking doors or selling, selling solar or whatever might be the hardest job you've ever had. And if you can't get through this, right, if you can't tap that inner inner you, then you're going to fail. 
right? right. And hell no, I ain't going to fail. I don't fail anything. I, I need to hear it, feel that. So anyway, people choose to work straight commission versus base, right? So those who work, they need to know what they're getting into. Yeah, such great points. I mean, it's, you know, everybody has had some challenge. Sometimes they just don't recognize that they went through it, dealt with it, they got over it. Um, they moved to the other side and then recognizing that, hey, take that and harness it, like you said, to get through the next one. I, you know, I'll tell you a little story. I don't think I had ever mentioned this to you. I, I was talking to Brad Britton a while back and I told him and he had no idea. Sure. When I was an early co rep in Sacramento, I was good at getting appointments. I had no problem. I'd get a bunch of referrals. I'd get a bunch of appointments, but I was terrified to go on the appointment. And so I would find reasons to cancel. Oh, I got lost. I had car problems. And, you know, thank goodness I had a manager at the time that wouldn't let me quit. And, you know, eventually I started getting more comfortable in the meetings and started to do well. And once you get a little taste of success, you know, you want more of it. But I often look back at that time among a bunch of other things. It's like I was able to get over that fear, get over that doubt. And it was all in my head, right? I was just making up all these what if scenarios that were never going to happen. But in my mind, I was fixated on the past versus fixated on what I could go do. And that was really the big thing I or the big change I had to make was look forward, stop looking backwards. Yeah. You said something that, you, you know, with the traits of a, a good salesperson. Um, and I talked about the, the doing things hard and fixation, but, but also like you got to be a little bit, well, I don't call it say naive or, or, you know, the, if you're all over the place, if you're constantly looking for a better opportunity, right? You're never going to succeed, yeah. right? And what will end up happening is you'll be forced to do something. And once you've given in, you've given in, right? Like, this is what I, the only thing I could do, right? Like, then, okay, I'm going to be good at it. But there's too much distraction in this world today, right? And too many other people, one of my salespeople right now, every night he's watching different people on YouTube, but I'm like, stop, right? Like, you're a dreamer, right? And so that shit gets in your head and you're all over the place. You just got to go put your head down and grind and go look up 30 days from now. Like, yeah. and you'll have a better month, but, you know, they have to be able to focus and I would say for an extended period of time, and you know the example of the old school water pump, right? You just pump and pump, the water comes up. But if you stop, it goes down. Some people get so close to just success that that they miss it because they're looking at something else. Now, I think it's a leader's responsibility to to properly direct somebody if they're not cut out mm -hmm. and, and not let them just, just flounder. But I would say any job takes two years two years to have real progress. And five years is kind of the numbers. The number I gave myself when I was in Cutco, I'm going to give it five years and reevaluate. At the five-year mark, they moved me to LA. I'm going to give it five years and reevaluate. I did that for the first two five-year bunches. I did not do it for the third, which is why I probably kind of had that point where I was looking for other things. Yeah, I do the five-year kind of mark as well. Well, so JP, one of the themes of the of this podcast is, you know, especially in the high-tech sales, a lot of upside, you can make a lot of money, but you really do need to learn in order to excel. So you need to learn from the best and then you know, learn, you start to execute, you start to see your earnings go up. But you know, a lot of my uh, people that I've met in my industry, we're not necessarily in high tech because we absolutely love working. We're doing it because there's upside there that can help us get to some other freedom or some other goal or some other dream that we have. And so it's, what do you do with that income once you make it? Uh, so I'm curious, you know, from your experience, you know, what are some of the things that you've done once you've earned it to kind of set yourself up for the future financially? So that's a great question. So, you know, but the people listening may not, I got married at 38, first kids at 40. So the decisions I made pre-children were much different than the decisions I've made post-children. I had a decent savings, nest egg, investments, whatever you want to call it by the time I started having kids. So I spend a lot more now <laughs> yeah. than I did pre. Now, part of it's because there's kids involved, yeah. but... Uh, once you realize that, okay, I'm not going to be destitute when I stop working and there's enough there to, you know, myself, I'm always going to be dabbling in something. So lately it's been like, do I really need a $65,000 trailer parked in my driveway? No, but I rent it out so I can, I made 5,000 bucks off it this summer when I wasn't using it, right? Like I'm still constantly thinking about how liabilities can make me money and, or my assets, but I'm creating memories. I'm spending money on memories right now, which I think will provide much more value for my children in the future. But for 1031 uh this whole property we bought in Hawaii, I think in 97 for oh, wow. 300 grand. <laughs> like it's on the water in Kauai, right? It's like it's where we list we listed it at 1.19. 
we voted free and clear since like 2000 or something, right? So what an amazing investment that was. Yeah. And and so we're going to go buy a second family home, you know, slash rental property in Southern Utah, which what was a very small investment turned into a very large cash purchase, right? <laughs> now we're, you know, I know that's not the best way to spend that money, but that's a whole other story. Yeah, creating more memories though in the yeah. process. Right. So to me, the real estate when I was young was, was a huge place. Moving to Utah again, like we had choices. We sold our house in California. I'm like, then there was a lot of money in it. And I'm like, how should we move into this? The smart thing would have been about just a reasonable size home and just, you know, downsized. But my parents lived with us, right? And so I looked at my wife and I'm like, look, I don't care where the house, where the money is. And I think the economy is going to boom in Utah. So we bought a $1.3 million home here in Utah. It's 10,000 square feet, right? Massive yard, but my parents live in our basement. And so I chose to put that money to work here. Now, I think it's probably sell for two two today, right? So six years. So was that the best investment? Was that would I advise that to somebody who wasn't my age without kid? No, absolutely not. I would not do that. I would do much different. But that was the choice to do with that chunk of money was to just put it in a place we get some appreciation in real estate. Yeah, I guess two years ago, we business partner of mine, we bought 17 mobile homes in Texas. And that play, I mean, the strategic, I knew my Vivint stock was going to vest. And I was going to have this huge earning year that I couldn't really do anything to as a W-2 at the time to, to offset that. So we bought this 17 mobile homes and accelerated the depreciation and pulled out like 600000 depreciation in year one. And I got $140,000 tax return. Like all because of this. So now we have this asset that's barely, it's cash flowing, but I'm like, now we got to wait until we can go and spin into something else. Yeah. Do you still um, own it? Yeah, we still own those 17 homes. And I got to figure out, I just learned recently, unfortunately, that you might not be able to 1031 uh, mobile homes because they could be personal property, but in Texas County and this County in Texas might be different. So I'm working through that. So if anybody's listening, has any ideas on, uh, it's in San Benito, Texas on 1031 of mobile homes uh, in Texas. And then we also, and then going, going through the exec ed program, I learned a lot about people who are syndicating and raising money and doing fun. So I wanted to try that. I went out and raised 600,000 bucks, bought 28, my business partner, my same business partner, went out and raised some friends and family money, and then bought 28 rental doors in Chattanooga. And that's been a whole nother challenge, but yeah, Yeah. it's all been educational. Yeah. Well, um, you know, many of my listeners know that I'm also pretty active in real estate. It's, uh, it's something I've been doing for 20 plus years as I've been working in high tech sales and uh, it's been a great way to build up an additional stream of income. You know, if anybody wants to learn more about investing in, in real estate, on my website, I have an ebook. I also have a webinar. You can go to hightechfreedom.com and there's an ebook there. Uh, we have a newsletter. You can also go to hightechfreedom.com slash webinar. And I have an educational webinar that's posted there that you can check out. Well, good stuff, JP. Hey, um, there is so much more that I want to talk to you about. I do know that you have a, a hard stop coming up here. So I, I would actually... Love to have you back sometime to talk a little bit more about you know leadership and some of the things that you've been working on over the years. But as we wrap up, a big part of what I think is being a good human and being successful is what do we do to give back? So I'm just curious, is there anything that you're passionate about in terms of giving back or charitable causes that you might want to share? Yeah, that's a great question. I haven't talked to my wife about this. I'm like, he's going to ask me this question and I don't like my answer. Yeah. So is there's my time. You know, and it's not a money thing or given it. It's, I don't have influence on how it's spent. So I've never been, not, not that I haven't donated and whatnot, but I have a few things that I feel that I do that give back. Coaching is one of them, right? I coach my kids in baseball. And it's not something, again, it's not charitable by it means, but I want to influence people, right? And, and by me giving you money and then you giving that money to somebody else and sure it ends up on hopefully ends up on somebody's food table somewhere and i've been to you know i've been to charity charity events with them i always spent my money and i went i donated my accounts and flew to flew to peru and painted the churches and did all that work and while that's great i found myself playing soccer on the concrete with the kids Mm -hmm. right and i wasn't dodging the work but yeah we're doing this with the kids but they're sitting there watching us right they want to interact and human capital and and so probably can do a lot more here chris in a way that i don't say i feel bad for you asking but my my work has a lot i think a lot more like the stuff i do at harvard sure they pay me a little bit but i really do it because and i can read you thank you note after thank you note from people like and these are really successful people we're like this really changed my life, right? The mm-hmm. value I got from you, probably more than the academics I got from Harvard. And not saying that uh, offshoot uh, academics, but what they've never had in their life is somebody that has really believed in them mm-hmm. and really told them like, 
hey, you're here for a reason. And I don't see that as charity at all. And I yeah. would never give money either and think that would be charity either. I said, what does that do for people? And how does that make their life better? Kids make, you know, we do. And again, they, this is just what we do. They make that, what can they call bags of mercy, right? And there's, they make 20 or 30 at a time and they put, they put four or five in each car and we're on the streets and we're teaching our kids on how to do that. But that only goes so far. I think the impact you can have on a human and change their life. Like there have been people that, that I've met that, they were, that were homeless. Yeah, and they ended up living with me, and then I'm getting them a job. I helped them buy a car, right? And a couple of weeks ago, and oh, sorry to hear that. This individual just calls me or texts me. He's like, "Man, my life has been ever changed that day you allowed me to come in and take a shower." And and you know, and then when I moved to LA, like I get a knock at two o'clock in the morning. The moving man's still out front. This guy just moved to LA found me in the middle of LA, <laughs> right? And he's like, you're here, I'm here. So I, you know, impacting people who then go and impact people, that's what I do. But as far as causes, what I would say is just do right by people. If it hits you the right way, I get the random, you know, so-and-so lost their job, they just got their house burned down. Sure, I'll send money there. But as far as organizing kind of events or works, it's not really my yeah. thing. Yeah, well, so I mean, you invest in people. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and you've always had from the time when we were a little bit closer when I lived in California. I mean, you were always... You, you mean kinda, when you lived in my house? I was just going to say you had kind of an open door policy. So I, I was living there. Deb was living there for a little while and we we're working in the Red Bluff office. And you, yeah. know, you just had people come, you know, come on in. Still that way, by the way. Right now, so it's probably not... I won't name names here, but somebody I worked with a few years ago. He was young. He was married. He had kids. Really young to be having kids in today's world. And I just saw so much potential in him. And then I ended up leaving Vivint. And he was out and about and started working somewhere else. And he would always listen to my podcast and send me messages. I get a random message, you know, three months ago. Basically, it says, I need you. And I said, so we got on the phone and I said, great, what we'll do. And we set something up for him to stabilize his life. This is the greatest sales job in the history of sales right now. And I'm going to get 40 phone calls when people hear this. But he flies in every other week here to Utah. Now he pays his $49 flight on his own. And then he drives my $100,000 Tesla for a week while living at my house doing solar appointments for me. And I drive my 2015 beat up Ford F-250 on motorcycles. And he's out driving my Tesla right now on appointments. Why? It's because I just invested in him years ago. And I want to have a positive impact on the lives of others and change the course of history. He's got two young kids. He's 24 years old. He's divorced. And he's just trying to... And like, this is the right thing to do. Yeah. And so... Is that charity? No. Does that take time and money and energy? Every night when he comes home, me, he and I'm talking about his appointments for the day, right? I, was, I got up at 6.30 this morning to take Jackson to breakfast and he was gone. Yeah. I'm like, where are you at? He's like, 30 day miracle morning, right? I got to change this. I got to do things to impact people who then impact other people. I love it, man. We'll keep it going. Well, JP, if somebody wants to reach out or get connected up with you, how can they reach out? I'm not huge on social media, but I do have a LinkedIn profile, JP Arley, A-R-L-I-E. I think everything I've ever done is JP Arley, my Facebook, my Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm not creative. I don't have any like sexy names on Instagram. And you can also email me, same email address, JP Arley at Mac.com. Sounds good. Well, hey, really appreciate the time. Thank you. And I look forward to catching up with you again. Let's, let's do this again. Okay, real quick shot that if you haven't seen my kids behind me, my wife doesn't allow me to have pictures of her on camera, but uh, that's that's Jackson, that's Cooper, and that's, that's Harrison. We call him Chaos, Mayhem, and the Terrorist, right? <laughs> so uh, uh, they, they, they are here waiting for me to take them to football right now. All right, well, take care. I'll let you go. Have a good one. All right, thanks, Chris. Thanks again for joining us today. To get more sales and real estate tips, you can subscribe to our newsletter at hightechfreedom.com. You can also join our private Facebook and LinkedIn group that is exclusively for sales professionals. If you found a nugget of good information in the podcast, please subscribe, give us a positive rating and write a review. If there is a topic that you would like us to cover in the future, please send us a note through our website at hightechfreedom.com. Until next week, make this your best week ever.